welcome to another episode of Death By, where contestants will earn reps for their arguments for a chance to stand on top of the podium pedestal. I am your host, Lauren Khalil. Whoever I decide has the best argument through the final round will earn 30 seconds to talk about a topic of their choosing. On today's episode, we have two-time affiliate pup champion and seminar staff head trainer, James Hobart. CrossFit coach, Kenny Johnson, also known as KJ. And American professional strongman and programmer of HWPO Strong, Rob Kearney. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's going to be a good day. Who's ready for some fun? Can't wait. Rob's getting ready to dye his beard. It's growing out quite lovely right now. Couple of weeks, couple of weeks. I'll be a new man. We can't wait to see it. Let's get started and let's play Death By. Topic number one. Earlier this week, HWPO announced the acquisition of DECA Comp, the addition of Michelle Latendre to its team to spearhead the launch of affiliate programming. Now, it appears that HWPO is taking a growth-oriented approach through this move by adding more to their already well-established programming. But with a stacked list of other major training camps in the space, what are other ways that these programs can survive in the ecosystem? Rob Kearney is somebody who is at HWPO and has been clued into this move well before us. We'll let you start round number one. Yeah, you know, I think it really depends on how each camp kind of really separates himself. Um, obviously, I'm a little partial to HWPO, but I really love the approach that Matt has taken when bringing this company to life. I think there are a lot of really smart coaches in the CrossFit space, but one thing that Matt identified was sometimes CrossFit coaches aren't the right coaches for certain types of things that we need to be getting better at. That's why we saw the addition of myself, Amy Everett, for you know, our power based movements on my side of things with strongman implements and power lifts and then Amy ever coming in with Olympic lifts, um, you know, on our staff right now with the addition of Michelle, we have seven coaches um, with HWPO who all handle all of our individual HWPO training programs, as well as work with our games athletes as well. So I think what, what it really comes down to is in order to survive in the space with CrossFit growing, with camps getting bigger, it's how do you delineate yourself and differentiate differentiate yourself from everybody else that's been doing and kind of following along the same path. It's where do these tangents go, but how does it always stay true to the ethos of the company? Mm. Three points for Rob. Kenny, we'll go to you next, <laughs> especially as somebody who formerly worked with a training camp, longtime coach at Comp Train. What is your take on this topic? One, I just want to say, I think I love this for HWPO. Um, they're bringing in somebody who's going to add to their already wide repertoire of offerings without having to create something from scratch, which is a really cool way to grow your brand without having to build um, the affiliate side, which HWPO has not had yet, and bringing somebody in who already has that ability and along with a really reputable name and somebody who's uh, respected in this space. I love that move for HWPO. It's a cool way to add without having to just build something right from the get-go. Get um, one of the things just to push on though is like, this is a much bigger enterprise and thus it costs a lot more money to run this. HWPO is leaning into this specialization as Rob already touched on. You have people who know their craft, which does widen your offering. It also costs a lot more to pay all of these coaches that are specialized. So in order to be able to afford these guys, you need to have enough people coming in to use your product in order to offset that increased cost. So with the more leaning into the more offerings, the more people need to be able to pay you in order to do that. So if those things are not aligned, you really can push yourself into a corner where you're overextended and bloated. I think we've seen that in the space with a couple of the brands that have gone up and down. It's They bring in a lot of people and then it sort of dwindles down and then they don't have the income coming in as those numbers dip and dodge along the way. Um, so there's two kind of ways that you can approach this. You can go with this really specialized model that gives you all of these options to really hone in on the craft, or you can keep it really tight and lean. There is room for a lot of these smaller operations to continue to be successful, but what they need to think about is, 
can they continue to do exactly what Rob said, which is know your niche, know your specialization, and try not to drift too far from that. If it's HWPO and you want to add all of these options, that's great, but you have to have the people coming in in order to be able to offset that. If it's two people with really great programming, that's what you're promising you're delivering. You're not going to give all of these other bells and whistles. You're not renting out a hundred and 10,000 square foot uh, campground at the CrossFit Games. You're going to be, this is what we do. We do it really well. And we serve these people with the ethos that's true to us. You don't need more than a couple hundred people subscribing to your program. And one of the things I think we've seen is people are incredibly loyal to these things. There's an ethos that matches each one of these training camps. And if you stay true to that and stay really, really tight, you can be successful on either side of this spectrum. Four points for Kenny. James, you've been uh, in the CrossFit space for a very, very long time. You've seen the ups and downs, the ways that training camps have come into the space, gone out of the space. What do you think here? Yeah, I, I just laugh because that's a nice way of saying I'm just old. Um, <laughs> this is good. You know, the these guys- not old, so you can't be old. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Very nice recovery. Um, <laughs> these guys hit on a, a lot of the good stuff here. I'm nervous to say this, you know, and I, I agree with the concept of like staying true to a core ethos, like not building and branching out too fast. I think it is really cool to see HWPO um, branch into the affiliate space and working with Michelle is amazing. Like she has been doing this at the elite level, at the affiliate level and everything in between for a long time. So like what an amazing um, acquisition and a uh, partnership and person to bring in house for them. I wonder if there is some solution and success too in having a training camp coupled to a physical space. Like I, you know, and KJ said this, I know how expensive these spaces can get and how quickly you can, um, I don't know, overreach on these spaces. But I do wonder is like there, is there an ability to support that training camp with an ongoing affiliate? So you have that physical space, you have that location on top of building out all of those programming offerings, which are essentially digital. Um, the other thing I think is really interesting for a lot of these um, different companies, and I see them doing is building out into something like an app because it does like you can have the best programming in the world, but I think there's such a huge expectation in among CrossFitters, athletes in general, to have the delivery of that programming be so easy. So seeing them branch out into an app space is also really interesting. But again, you start seeing dollar signs adds up, add up for maintaining these things. But I do think there's an awesome world where you have a physical space that, you know, sort of is the foundation of this training camp. People can come visit there, experience what the best in the world experience, and then all of these programming solutions to support it. So probably might put my foot in my mouth on that one, but... Um, I don't know. It's an interesting thing to consider. No, I really like those ideas as well. Three points for James. I'm curious if we had to go down one path or another, do you guys think that in the next three years, we'll see more training camps merge together or less training camps in the space? I think we're going to see a combination of both. And I think one of the things that's really important to delineate here is that training camp and offering programming to people like myself who are not going to the CrossFit Games. I want to be a really good athlete. I want to do a little bit extra. They're not recruiting me to come and train every day at their affiliate or at their um, separate training facility. Uh, the two different things matter. Now, are we recruiting 20 athletes into a camp? I don't know that that works, whether you have 20 coaches for those individual athletes. A lot of these guys have uh, really personal needs. They like things a certain way. I don't know if it works with 20 athletes coming into a camp all of the time. What I do think you can see is a little bit larger of these um, program offering units, whatever we want to call it, these companies that are a little bit larger. We're going to see maybe HWPO and Proven maybe be the big pinnacles and Mayhem's been around for a really long time. And then some of the smaller ones are just sort of surviving, but might actually thrive on the one-on-one -on -one coaching level. You know, we've got Kotler who has a number of athletes, but they have one of the smaller programming units. And maybe that's great for them. Um, I just don't know that we're going to see 25 athletes in one camp unless there's a separation that looks similar to what it is now. They're working with a coach here and there, and they're maybe associated with the camp. Yeah, I mean, I would have to agree. I mean, as, as somebody that, you know, is currently coaching a rather large camp of elite athletes, um, it gets really tough 
even with, um, you know, the specialized coaches that we have, we have head coaches for each athlete, but to manage that, to program effectively, to really stay on top of your athletes, hold them accountable, making sure they're staying on top of everything that they need to do be, to be competitive in this sport, because it is getting so much more competitive. Having larger groups of these competitive athletes just makes it really tough um, from a coaching side of things. You know, as KJ said earlier, in order to really do both things really well, that means you have to have a lot of coaches that are highly specialized, but the price tag comes along with that. To really expand that roster out too big is too much of a financial draw on a company unless they are subsidizing that income other ways. Mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, maybe that's something that comes down the road where camps are getting sponsorships from teams and that kind of goes into something we've talked about a lot on this show, the professionalization of the sport as a whole. You know, do we start seeing some sponsorships going to camps to help pay for better coaching and athletes? Who knows where this is really going to go? Um, but in order to go down that road, there's a big price tag that comes along with that. James, which path are you going down? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I, I do think you're going to see some more um, combine and continue to collaborate. And I think that makes a lot of sense. One of the other things I wonder too, that maybe hasn't been said here. It's like, I think about this, you know, we think about this so much from like the elite athlete, games athlete, um, interest, you know, weekend warrior athlete, people who just might go to an affiliate, but also follow XYZ program in the open gym time. Um, but I, you know, I also wonder is like, what services are we giving out there to coaches, right? So I know that if I ever get the chance to train with Rob, yeah, it's super fun for me as an athlete. But at the same time, I'm trying to soak up knowledge because he has so much to that specific um, sport of strongman. And I'm going to bring that back and I'm going to share some of that with my athletes that I coach in my gym. I, I will say that's like the, one of the biggest luxuries I've had in my coaching career is working with specialist athletes, elite, you know, athletes and being able to be like, yeah, yeah, I get how this applies to me. But some of this knowledge, you know, athletes in the gym are so thirsty for to get from their CrossFit coaches. So I also wonder is like, what services are we offering to CrossFit coaches in terms of making them better through all of these specialists that some of these camps have um, brought in and aggregated. Mm. Some really mm. good ideas. Uh, the ecosystem, I think, is very interesting, especially when we talk about whether it's oversaturated or not, or is there enough space for everybody? Just the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure we'll have more to talk about as we get closer to the season. And uh, Rob, congratulations to you and the rest of your training camp on the news. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're, we're extremely excited. I mean, Michelle is one, just an unbelievable person, but also mm -hmm. to add her knowledge and her experience as one of our coaches on staff to head up the affiliate programming. It's um, lucky doesn't even begin to describe, you know, I think how all of us feel with her coming on board. She's a great person. Awesome coach. Glad to have her with you guys. Okay. Let's move now on to topic Number two, uh, we're looking at the rule book now. And according to the CrossFit Games rule book, one of the requirements to be on a team, each open workout must be performed in the same physical location as the team's affiliate. Failure to meet these requirements or the inability to prove the requirements have been met can result in a team and or individual athlete being disqualified, which is exactly what we saw last week for a handful of teams. And while many of us can probably agree that the rule is clearly stated in the rule book, my question is, should the team eligibility rule be as it stands? Why or why not? KJ, we will start the second round with you. I'm going to get a little passionate here, so bear with me, but like, <laughs> what are we doing here? Like, what is our goal with this whole thing? Are we trying to get the best athletes on the biggest stage? Are we trying to grow our sport? Are we trying to get more money into it? Or are we trying to pretend that this is a thing that it's not? This is not an affiliate cup. It hasn't been for a long time. We pushed it down the road one year when we made a bunch of rules in order to try to force people into a gym. But what we did was just took all the haves, people who have money, sponsorships, and ability to move around the country and the world, gave them the ability to come on to super teams and wax everybody who was trying to do this inside of their own affiliate. If you have four to six people inside of your gym that are good enough to make semifinals on a team, you are in a spectacular place. 
I have athletes that I coach that are semifinal athletes that got on a plane every single week this year to fly to another country in order to find other athletes that they could go on to a team with. And they had the luxury to be able to do that simply because they're a little bit closer and getting around where they are is a little easier than it is in the United States. But if we are trying to grow our sport, we want the best athletes on the field. We would love to see more of our legends come out of the maybe retirement or towards their back end of their careers go team, get to see them on the field. Let's get rid of this stupid rule that already doesn't really exist and let the teams play. If you only have to do the quarterfinals together because those are the only team workouts you have to do, great, do those on the same spot. You're going to have to make that happen. But if you live in New Jersey and you want to compete with somebody in New York and that might give you a chance in order to get to semifinals, like that's awesome. What are we doing here to try to prevent that from happening? And functionally, we've already proven that the open workouts don't really matter for these athletes either. Like if you're good enough to go to quarterfinals, if you're good enough to go to semifinals, you could have fallen asleep in the open and done it in your backyard and you still would have gotten there. So like if we want to make this an affiliate cup, make it an affiliate cup. It's not. Let's get rid of the stupid rule. I'm eating my humble pie over here because the Open was not easy for me, KJ. We not are not hard. going to the games, Lauren. We're not talking about you and me. We okay. can do our best. <laughs> Crushing my dreams here on Death By. It's fine. Everything's going to be okay. Still four points. I love the passion that you're bringing today. James, what do you think about the rule? Should it be as it stands or are we changing another rule again? I thought we got rid of teams. I thought we decided that in one of the previous death buys and then they, they got rid of them. They asked them for the season. Um, or that. No, 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 no. Uh, gosh, you know, I didn't have a totally different answer. I'm going to go in a totally different direction. I don't know. I don't know what the eligibility is. You know, I lived through some of that and um, can't say I loved it, but made it work anyway because it was super important to me. What I would like to see in order to support those athletes who are not going to make it to the games, quarterfinals, semifinals, is I would like to see more incentive incentive for affiliates to participate even harder in the open. So I think we've talked about this before, but I think there is a way to do like a true affiliate cup sans elite athletes, you know, across the globe. I think it would be really cool to focus affiliates more on participation. Like, I don't know, the affiliate with the largest percentage of their affiliate participating in the open gets a free year of affiliation or something like that. It'd be really cool to see prizes like that go out um, to affiliates who participate in the open, maybe something like a most improved year to year. Yeah, there's tons of hurdles and obstacles here and technical implications, but to me, I think that would definitely make it more engaging and easier for all affiliates and all affiliate members to play. And for me, that's kind of what's really interesting and important at this point in my life. As far as the elite athletes, um, don't ever want anyone to be like financially hindered or, you know, have to suffer more than they uh, should in order to participate. But also, I don't know, it's kind of the price you pay to to chase that top of the podium spot, you know, at semifinals of the game. So I don't know, I guess I'm agnostic in terms of the rules of the games. Uh, Kenny, Kenny made some good points. I guess I'll just give me give me four, two of his four points and I'll take that. <laughs> No, honestly, I'm going to give you four points too, because I yes. like the thought of making it matter in a different way that brings it back to the affiliate. I don't necessarily think that that moves the needle for the sport and making teams more exciting at the CrossFit games, but I think that's a different conversation. So I'm still going to award you those points because making it affiliate centric is something that I think CrossFit as a whole could do a better job on. Awesome. Rob, last but not least, what do you think here? So we've had a yes, we've had a maybe, I'll take the no. Um, I So I think that the rule should stand. I think if we are looking at this in terms of what the teams mean at the games now, I think what we have talked about is how do we grow CrossFit as a sport? How do we make it more competitive? And what does it look like to the everyday person? They want to see the best athletes out on the field. Yes. However, when I look at the CrossFit season and I try to liken it to other professional sports, we always see, you know, we'll take baseball right now, right? Because baseball season just started. I try to look at the CrossFit season like a regular, like a professional sport season. And all of the baseball players will go to preseason and they'll practice together and they'll train together and they'll work out together to get them ready for preseason. And then they have their preseason scrimmages that gets them ready for the season. I kind of look at the open like the preseason. It's the team's chance to meet each other, 
to get to know each other and to start working together to put a formula together to what's going to get them to the next stage of the competitive year. So I think having them all have to compete together in the same affiliate or in the same space to do the open workouts. While yes, I understand they aren't necessarily team workouts, still supporting those people that are going to be your teammates through the open workout builds that different level of camaraderie and connection with each of your team members. And also it's a really good time to start strategizing how to, how to attack different workouts. You can scout each other a little bit. Be like, okay, well, on, you know, our dumbbell snatch workout, you know, so-and-so struggled a little bit with the cycling. So let's make sure they're focusing on that in the quarterfinals. And you can really pick apart each person's performance on a personal level and work towards a training plan that's going to get you more successful throughout the rest of the season. So for me, I think the eligibility rule does stand. We keep everybody together, doing the open together to help build that team camaraderie and make you more successful throughout the rest of the season. Mm, Rob, I'm going to give you five points for that. I like that you brought in a sport that is relevant right now. Baseball, it's (laughs) on the tip of everybody's mind, or at least sports fans. And it does progress the sport to make it more professional. I mean, it's hard. I think you all gave really good ideas. James thinking about the affiliates, Rob thinking about the professionalism of the sport. Kenny wants it to be more accessible. All really great answers, but uh, Rob is going to win this round. (laughs) KJ had some faces. Oh, I've got so many (laughs) counterpoints, but I love it. It's a great answer. Go ahead. Bring them on. Let's hear the counterparts. Open open table right now. I think what you're saying makes total sense. And if you're going to win this thing, that's what's going to happen. But that's already happening. Like... Noah has a team with two people who are from across the planet that moved to Florida to train with him. That's not growing the sport because those people already have sponsorships and have the ability to do that. It's people who work at a fire station who had to like squeak in an extra workout in order to maybe be able to make it onto a team to be able to get there that are really being punished by it. If you can move across the country because your sponsor's paying for it. Of course, you're going to spend as much time working together as you possibly can, and you're going to win. I think it actually makes it more prohibitive for people to want to do it on a maybe smaller scale. The biggest teams, the best teams the, are always going to have this. They're going to find the loopholes or they're going to be able to have the resources to exploit them. It's the people who don't have that ability, who don't have that flexibility that are actually the ones that get punished, even though the goal was to probably keep these super teams from happening. Um, that's more and more I come from. It's great. Like no, just get rid of it so then everybody can do it. <laughs> I, that's the thing is I don't even necessarily disagree with you. I yeah. think what the differentiator has to be is differentiating between CrossFit and the sport of CrossFit, right? Mm-hmm. They're two very mm-hmm. different things. Um, having these people move across the world to be on a team yeah at that point i'm considering you a professional athlete this is your livelihood you are doing this as a sport so maybe the better conversation is okay what do we have to do to grow crossfit and what do we have to do to grow the sport of crossfit to in my mind two extremely different conversations 100 percent. well and that's why i really think both of them can live in the space and why we should be having the conversation more of how could CrossFit split off to be sport and methodology? James, I, I don't want to get totally off the rails, but do you have any thoughts to whether you would think that would be more successful? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I have a lot of feelings about this this topic. I don't know if yeah. I have anything like well articulated. I just, and I think we discussed this a little bit last time. I still think it's worth investigating. Can we do both well? Hmm. Because I do think it's important and, substan- and, and at least substantial with how much it's accomplished so far. And maybe it is a point where like there really needs to be some like clear division between the two um, and they need to operate separately. I'm still of the belief, you know, and I don't have any data to back this up that like the growth of the sport and the sport significantly actually helps affiliates more than it hurts them. I'm probably, I know a lot of people argue on that, but it's a belief. Like I've just ran into enough people in my life who said, Hey, Oh, I saw CrossFit on Facebook, ESPN, blah, blah, blah. And I figured, Maybe I'll just go try it. Or that's really interesting. That's cool. I've always wanted to do it. Tell me more about it. So I don't know. I do have a hunch that that helps more than it hurts. I think these problems, you know, have been continually popped up, but also tried to be iterated upon year to year. I don't know what the perfect solution is. I still think it's worth investigating. How do we do both well? Um, And the only reason I say that, and this is funny, this goes back to a CrossFit New England thing. 
is one year at CrossFit New England, we had, and this is, you know, this example might be too small to compare, but we had um, the regular, not regular, but class athletes doing class stuff. And you had competitor athletes doing competitor stuff. And then come regionals time, there was just no support and there was no mix and there was no relationship and community between the two. So next year, that was when Ben really added as a core piece of the competitors programming was the class workout. It wasn't the only thing competitors did, but they had some element of the class workout in their programming. And so that led the competitors to be in class and then class athletes were like intermixing with the competitors. And it really built this really nice community and built support through the rest of the season. So I don't know if that applies, but I still think it's worth investigating. Um, you know, actually that analogy was terrible, No, but I still think it's worth investigating. Can we do both well, though? I, I think a lot of the um, points both these guys bring up are really valid. Another topic for another day. We will move on to topic number three, because tomorrow CrossFit will be releasing the individual quarterfinals workouts. What movements do you need to see in order to advance the correct people to semifinal. I want each of you to give one. If yours is taken by somebody else, you can use a different one. James, we'll let you kick off the final round. Oh boy. Um, I mean, mine is a, a wish list, but it can't really happen. I w- always would love to see a legitimate run in the lead, lead up to semifinals because I think that's the thing that goes untested. It's a very uniquely CrossFit thing, but it's not going to happen in any Um, you know, I don't think you can have somebody go do a 5k during quarterfinals. So, okay. Scratch that. I either think we need to get upside down and practice that skill, either in a press or some sort of fancy dancy handstand walk, or I would like they do with the teams. I'd like to see a heavier shoulder to overhead. I feel like that was not really tested during the open. I think it's a good evolution of the skills needed to thrive in the semifinal environment, but I will say this. I don't think quarterfinals needs to go insanely heavy to get the right people there. So quick one on that one. That's, that's what I got. James, I almost gave you zero points when you started mm-hmm. with saying that we needed a 5k. Uh, you took, <laughs> has anyone ever had points deducted in this show? Cause I would like to be the first. No, but you were going to be the first <laughs> until you said we need to get inverted. I'll give yeah, you one you. point for that. It could have been a hard, uh, a better answer if you kept the five k out, but w- we'll give you one point. For I saw, I saw you at the tactical games. You know, like running and gunning is your thing now. So you know, <laughs> yeah. But from one line to the next, no <laughs> it's like 5K. twelve feet. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with a five k. But in tactical games, they actually have to wear their weighted vest and their um their gun belt and all of these things. It's it's even more insane. But I want no part of that. All right, fair, fair. Okay, <laughs> moving on to Kenny. What do you think? What is the one movement you need to see? Okay, so this is tough because if it's only one movement and assuming we're only getting four workouts, we can't do anything that is specific weightlifting. We can't do anything that's specific gymnastics. And it's really difficult to do something that is specific monostructural. So if I only get one movement, I'm going to put the one thing that I think if you told me. 1,000 athletes, you gave me one thing that would tell me how fit they are. I'm going to say it's a 2K row. Put it in there. It's power. It's a little bit of endurance. It's Yes, it caters a little bit to a slightly larger athlete, but there's some small people who can rip that thing too. If you're going to give me one movement and one thing only, that's the best indicator that I'm going to get for one one simple thing. And it just doesn't can't lean too far with four workouts to go gymnastics or too heavy. It's got to be a combination of everything. Uh, does anybody feel like they hurt right now? Just thinking about that. It's the worst, it's the worst workout there is on planet earth. Yeah, I hate that. I love that answer. <laughs> I, I don't mind. It. <laughs> I, I hate the thought of it, but I do like the answer. Kenny will give you three points for the two K row. We'll see if it happens tomorrow. Rob, what do you got? All right, I have to ask a question. Okay. So one movement would so like my initial thought went to some kind of multi-part barbell complex. Would that count as one movement? Yeah, we'll let it slide. Yeah. There. All right, cool, cool, cool. So <laughs> it it aligns kind of like with my strength philosophy. Um, I'm a massive believer that pure strength is built off of a base of work capacity and volume. I think the best way to test that. Um, would be to see some kind of 
barbell complex, but not just our standard clean front squat jerk, right? Like I want to see something that's like built to a heavy load of like three cleans, two hang power cleans, three front squats, two jerks. Like give me something that's long, that's going to jack that heart rate up. That's going to put a time constraint on these athletes to have a little bit of strategy in there as well to make sure, okay, like we need to make smart jumps throughout this time period. We can't waste too much energy, but we also need to take our time to recover in between each one. But I would love to see like a six to eight rep barbell complex as one of these workouts, because you're going to see that heart rate get jacked up and also see some strategy and how they attack the barbell. Ooh, barbell cardio. That is a four point answer, Rob. <laughs> that so the real answer is do the 2K row, 10 minute clock, then do that complex. Ooh, now you have a good workout. Are we, are we programming quarterfinals right now? Is yes. That, is that what do that. Do that and do no <laughs> other workouts. I'm happy with whoever you get. Yeah. So if that was all you saw on the table, you think that we would advance the correct athletes to semifinals? Just from I don't think we're going to advance the right athletes with only four events in what we've done, but I think that's the best combination of what we're going to get. Rob, you agree? I saw the finger pointing up. A hundred percent. I agree. I think, um, I think the open workouts were amazing for affiliate buy-in for mm -hmm. community building and for affiliates to do these workouts. I don't necessarily agree that they were the best tests to advance the best athletes and to give us a really well-rounded picture of who is still competing in the season that can continue on to semifinals and the games after quarterfinals. Um, I was kind of hoping we were going to see six workouts for quarterfinals after the workouts we saw in the open to see a little bit more skill development and things in those open in the uh, in these quarterfinal workouts. But with just four, um, I think there might be some surprises at who may or may not make it on the semifinals. So I think it's four workouts, but six total or I'm sorry, five total scores, if I'm not mistaken. Does that change the conversation for you? Eh. It will tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> James, anything to add? I, I don't know. I don't know what we mean by the right athletes there. Like I, I definitely, I still think, you know, maybe you're like, well, you're not going to get the right. How many people are going to go to semis? 40, 30. 40. Um, maybe you're like, well, we're not gonna get all 40 of exactly the quote unquote right people there. But I think it's, you'll get all the right people there from 10th to first. Um, but yep. maybe that's me being a little bit, mean <sighs> i think you are if you're not going to get specialist workouts that's the key like it depends on what the programming is like if it's four tests and you lean too heavy one direction like legitimately like laura could not end up there you cannot finish 120th in a single workout and make it when there's only four you're gonna have to be top 50 in every single thing with four workouts, if they put one gatekeeper movement there, and again, not saying you should or shouldn't be there because of that, you can make that argument. But if they lean too heavily onto one one thing, there will be legitimately stars that are not there this year, and maybe that's okay. Well, we will find out what those workouts are tomorrow. If you're watching this on Wednesday, Wednesday is the day that the workouts will release noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Remember, there's going to be two windows. We'll have um, all of that info for you in our description to make sure you stay on track. But this means with 12 points, Rob Kearney is this week's Death by Champion. He Just already... saying, this puts me at 2-0. and oh. I'm undefeated now. <laughs> Undefeated for every time he's been on. He's That's earned 30 right. seconds. Rob, what do you want to talk about today? Um, I want to talk about all things strongman, not related to CrossFit whatsoever. We are coming up on uh, World's Strongest Man here in just a couple of weeks. It's an exciting time in the sport of strongman. Uh, 30 of the world's strongest athletes uh, going into Myrtle Beach, South Carolina to crown the 2024 World's Strongest Man. We have a lot of amazing athletes that are going to be there, myself included. Um, I'm feeling good. I'm excited. I love the events. And really, it's just a plug for myself to hype myself up for the competition I have coming up in three weeks because my body feels like I'm three weeks out from strumming competition and I hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard that's because you're so freaking strong, Rob. Do you have certain numbers or benchmarks that you're willing to reveal that you're trying to hit? Um, so just this past weekend, I had to do a heavy yoke walk. I work up to 1100 pounds. I went 60 feet in nine and a half seconds. Um, so 
could, could Lauren, James, and I on the same yoke move it? That's such a silly stat. That's like, um, it's like a, it's like a comic book stat. I'm, I'm really happy. I will say there is one workout. The the first event that we have here, second event, is this. They're calling it the sandbag steeplechase. It is three sandbags. It is a 20 meter course with a 52 inch bar height at 10 meters. Sandbags are 120 to 140 kilos. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to carry the first bag loaded. You thought I was going pounds, didn't you? Yeah. 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 yeah no kilos. <laughs> that um, <I> got <laughs> <laughs> so we have to carry the first one 10 meters, load over the bar, go back, get number two, load it over the bar, go back, get number three, load it over the bar, go underneath that 52 inch bar and do that all again. That's cool. In under 60 seconds. Wow. Dang. Yeah, that when I say I hurt, that's what I mean. So, like, <laughs> I did that one this past weekend. I finished just under 50 seconds and um, was pretty messed up for, for a few minutes after that. That'll take a toll on your CNS. Yep, just a bit. <laughs> I, I love the, like, I mean, that's CrossFit for people who can move 1,100 pounds, right? Like, it's really cool to see the overlap of these things. It's like, yeah, you guys aren't going 20 minutes long, but so many of your workouts do have maximal parallels to what CrossFit is. It's slightly different, but it's wild to, like, that's a horrible workout if that is pounds for me, right? Like, <laughs> Ask me to do that. And I'm like, I will be messed up from that. That's just, yeah. that's really cool. Who, who programs? The, go Sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, um, go ahead. I was just going to say, that's, that's one of the reasons why I have continuously kept CrossFit in my training program since mm. 2009, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because I've always seen the parallels between the two sports and how understanding how energy systems work and, and seeing how these different levels of conditioning can help me as an athlete um in strongman that's why i have you know usually in my off season and as i get once i get closer to contests i get a little bit more specified and i take all the crossfit out but i mean i keep it in my programming um pretty often james what were you gonna ask i was just curious how do those events get programmed like who is who is the the dave castro you know adrian bosman team of the strongman world um so it is really um these guys um darren sadler and colin bryce uh they own giants live um, they are kind of seen as the tournament directors for World's Strongest Man, which is owned by IMG and Endeavor. Um, and Colin and Darren, uh, you know, so Giants Live is the World's Strongest Man qualifying tour, these massive arena shows all over the world. And uh, they're kind of the ones that put their heads together and figure out what are going to be the best tests of strength and athleticism to find who is the World's Strongest Man. And that's one of the reasons I love the sport so much is because it's not just about how much you can lift is we have to be athletes at the end of the day as well. Mm -hmm. Rob, really cool. good luck. We're going to be yeah, watching you closely. Yeah. Good luck getting healthy and making sure that you stay healthy before you compete. And then you're going to crush it. Hit all of those really, really strong kilo numbers that I can't even wrap my head around. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, the sandbag, it's like what? It's 265, 130 kilos is about 285 and then 140 is 310. So Oh. The last two sandbags are heavier than my body weight, so that's <laughs> every sandbag's heavier than my body weight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, Rob, good luck. Congratulations. Thank Thanks you. for joining Rob, Kenny, James for another episode of Death by. Thank you for everybody who was watching. Good luck if you're competing in quarterfinals, and we will see you next time.